Um, so let's start. Um, so let me introduce our speaker, uh, Shachar uh, Gutzinski from the Weizmann Institute. And his talk is titled From Cognitive Biases to the Communication Complexity of Local Search. Um, so thank you very much, Shachar. Okay, thanks. Um, so uh, what I want to do in this talk is to tell you how we started uh, thinking about cognitive biases in auctions and like ended up thinking about something that is completely different which is the communication complexity of local search. And this talk is uh, um, based on two joint works, one with uh, Moshe Babayov and Sigal Oren, and the other one with Yakov Obichenko and Noam Nissan. Okay, so um, the traditional approach in, in game theory and economics is to assume that individuals are rational and they have some utility function in mind and they do all they can in order to maximize this utility function. Now, behavioral economics contests this point of view. Uh, what behavioral economists are claiming is that, uh, yes, it is indeed true that um, it is true that people have some utility function in mind and they want to maximize it, but they have some cognitive biases that sometimes make them behave irrational. Let me give you one example for a cognitive bias and we'll see uh, uh, other examples later. Um, for example, you know, I know that exercising is good for me in the long run, and uh, I have a couple of free hours tomorrow. So, like, I'm planning on, uh, um, I'm planning on uh, um, going to the gym tomorrow. Then, you know, tomorrow comes, and I have to go to the gym now. But I don't really want to go to the gym now, so I'm postponing it to the uh, to the next day. And then the next day come, and you know, I do the same calculation. Yeah, I want to go to the gym, but not now. So let's postpone it and so on and so on and so forth. So this cognitive bias uh, is called uh, a present bias, that these actions that are taking care of today are most salient to me, okay? Uh, and again, we'll see uh, uh, other examples of cognitive biases later in this talk. Um, now, uh, the whole point of the field of behavioral economics is to try to understand which cognitive biases do people have and try to predict how they will behave in uh, different situations. Okay. Um, so uh, in the last few years, we've seen like a line of work that tries to uh, uh, merge a bit between uh, with game theory and behavioral economics. Um, most of the work uh, focused on an attempt to model and rigorously analyze the behavior of individuals that exhibit cognitive biases. That is, suppose we have some uh, uh, individual that uh, wants to complete uh, his goal, but maybe has like a present bias. So we want to give him rewards along the way in order to make sure he completes his goal. Okay. So the main focus was to mitigate the negative effects in uh, uh, planning settings. Um, what we're going to do in this work is a little bit different. Instead of uh, take like, you know, planning setting and try to mitigate the negative effects of, uh, 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 the negative effects of, uh, um, of cognitive biases, we're going to uh, take a well-known economic model and we're going to enhance it with cognitive biases. And what we'll see is that uh, 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 cognitive biases can actually, uh, uh, if we take them into account, we can actually improve the uh, outcome. Okay? So not only that we don't view cognitive biases as a bad thing, we're actually going to take advantage of them in order to improve the, uh, the outcome. And uh, we'll see that uh, this uh, uh, model, when we consider cognitive biases, naturally gives rise to the theory of computer science questions and the complexity of local search. And uh, uh, in the second part of the talk, we'll try to uh, uh, analyze this uh, theory of computer science question, and we'll, we will actually be able to answer this. Yeah. Um, OK, so uh, let's start with the main part of the talk. And we're going to discuss what region equilibrium and endowment effect. Um, and I'm going to explain uh, both terms. And let's first start with the endowment effect. So uh, the endowment effect is a term that was uh, uh, coined by um, Richard Thaler in his uh, um, 1980 paper. Um, and to demonstrate this effect, uh, Thaler uh, tells us the following story. So this was in the 50s. He had a friend called uh, Mr. R. 
and uh, Mr. R bought a case of uh, a good wine for something like uh, $5 a bottle. Um, so a few years later, a, a, a wine merchant approached it, approached him and uh, suggested to buy uh, the wine back for something like $100 a bottle. Mr. R refused. Uh, now, that was kind of strange because uh, uh, before that, Mr. R never, uh, uh, never paid more than $35 uh, per bottle of wine, but still he refused to, uh, 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 to pay that much. So why is it so? Teller's explanation is that Mr. R felt so attached to the wine that he owned that uh, he valued it more than he would value the same wine if he had to go and uh, uh, buy it from a store. So this is the endowment effect. You, you, you get some things and you know, and the, the value of them for you increases. You feel attached to them. Here is an experiment that uh, tries to uh, uh, demonstrate this effect. Um, this was uh, 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 taking uh, place at uh, 1989 by Knatch. Um, so this experiment took place at the University of Victoria. Uh, a class of, uh, an economics class was split into two. Half of them got uh, uh, marks, these, uh, these uh, University of Victoria marks, and the other one uh, got a chocolate bar. Okay? Uh, so the class was randomly split. And now uh, each student in the class was asked, do you prefer a coffee mug or do you prefer a chocolate bar? And what were the results? And uh, I think that you know, we can uh, already guess them. 90% of the mug owners uh, uh, said that they preferred the mug over the chocolate bar. Well, 89% of the chocolate bar owners said that they prefer the uh, uh, chocolate bar over the mug. Okay. Um, now, you know, we call that uh, uh, people, students in this class were randomly split, so it is not very likely that we had like a really bad luck. Indeed, when you ask like students who didn't receive any item what they prefer, uh, then, you know, they're more or less split between uh, uh, the mug and the chocolate bar. So the explanation for that is that, you know, people got the item, people got uh, the good, and they have higher value for it once they hold it. Okay, here is uh, a, another attempt, uh, but now it will try to quantify the endowment effect. Uh, this experiment took place at uh, uh, Cornell University, again with mugs. Uh, so um, each, uh, uh, each student in a law and economics class had a chance to uh, 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 have a look at this uh, nice Cornell University uh, mug. Um, and half of them, a random half of them, got the mug. And, and now uh, each student, both, of, both uh, uh, those who received the mug and those who didn't, each student was asked uh, for how, how much are we ready to either sell or buy the mug. Okay, what is your value for the mug? Um, now, students who received the mug were ready to sell it for a price of about $5. Students who didn't receive the mug were, were ready to uh, uh, pay for it only a price of about $2. Okay, so you again see the gap between uh, 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 people who received the good and people who didn't. The, uh, the value of the good changes for the people who received the mug. Uh, and in general, what the endowment effect is telling us is that the mere possession of an item makes it more valuable for us. Okay? So this is the uh, endowment effect. Now, um, now I want to uh, uh, talk about the Eurasian equilibrium. And after a quick introduction, we'll get back to uh, the endowment effect. So what is the Eurasian equilibrium? What I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, start with an example. Uh, I'll give. I'll, I'll, and then I'll give you some uh, uh, more formal definition and hopefully it will uh, clarify everything. And I didn't tell it in the beginning, but of course, if, you, if anything is unclear, please uh, uh, do stop and ask. Um, okay, so let's consider like a very simple market. This market uh, uh, consists of two players, uh, uh, which are Mario and the princess, and two pictures, uh, a Keith Ehring picture and an Andy Wall picture. Now, uh, we want to somehow allocate the goods between uh, 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 Mario and the princess. And uh, let's uh, see how much each of the players value the goods. So Mario has a value of $600 for getting the, uh, the uh, Keith Aaron picture. 
it also has the same value for the Andy Wall picture. You know, if he uh, uh, gets one of them, uh, he's very happy, he can put them in the living room. If he gets both of them, he has enough space, he can put both of them in the living room and his value is $1,200, just simply the sum of $600 and $600. So this is, uh, 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 this is Mario. What about the princess? Uh, she, is, uh, she has a smaller living room, so she has like a value of $1,000 for uh, 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 putting the uh, uh, Keith Aaron picture in her, uh, uh, in her living room. Uh, she has the same value for putting the uh, um, the Wall picture alone in her living room, but she has a very small living room and she doesn't have enough space to put both of them. So, you know, if she, even if she gets uh, uh, both pictures, she can put only one uh, uh, at her living room for, for, and her value is $1,000. Okay, so this is like a very simple market. One of the Mario is simply additive, it gets more item, his value increases additively. Uh, the other one, the princess, she's only interested in getting one item. If she gets one, she's maximally happy. If not, then she's not. Um, okay, so now we're interested in what is called a market clearing prices. Okay. Uh, what are market clearing prices? These are market which uh, uh, both uh, uh, Mario and the princess can get what they want, can get the set of items that maximizes their profit under these market clearing prices. And, you know, we manage to uh, allocate all items in, in, the, uh, in the economy. For example, if we put a price of $600 for the uh, 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 key theorem, for the annual picture and six hundred dollar for the key theorem picture, then I claim that the allocations that give Mario the uh, uh, the uh, key theorem picture and the princess the uh, Andy Wall picture uh, uh, is great in the sense that you know each of the players just got a bundle that maximum makes them maximally happy under the current prices. For example, uh, uh, Mario gets uh, uh, as a profit of zero. He pays $600 for a picture that has a value of $600 for, it, for him. Uh, uh, so his profit is zero. If he would have taken the uh, Andy Wall picture, his uh, profit would also be zero, right? Uh, again, price 600, price 600 values, value uh, 600. And he could potentially take both uh, 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 pictures, but this wouldn't increase his profit. It would pay $1,200 for something that has uh, uh, a value of $1,200. Uh, what about the princess? Well, she's taking a picture that has a value of, uh, that has a value of $1,000, and she pays only $600, so, so her profit is $400. This would be uh, her profit also if she would have taken the other picture. If she would have taken both pictures, then she would pay $1,200 for something that has a value of only $1,000. In this case, she will have a negative profit, so this is some, certainly something that she doesn't want to do. Okay? So these are market clearing, market clearing prices, a set of prices such that each bidder takes whatever he wants, no bidder takes the same, items, the same item twice, and uh, 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 all items are taken from the market. Let's see uh, uh, a more formal definition of a regional equilibrium. So first, let's have this object. This is called the valuation function. This is simply a function. VI is simply a function. So that VIS is the value of player I for a bundle S. For example, uh, uh, Mario's value for each of the pictures alone was $600, and together it was $1,200. Okay, so this is the valuation function. Um, and now we can define a valuation equilibrium. A valuation equilibrium is simply a set of prices P1 to Pm, okay? so this is a price uh, for each item, and allocation of all items, A1 to An, so A1 is the bundle that player one gets, but A2 is the bundle that player two gets, and so on, okay? Such that what happens? Each bidder is happy, okay? Bidder I takes the bundle AI and pay the sum of the prices of items in AI, okay? And uh, he's uh, uh, maximally happy. There is no other bundle that uh, has a higher profit for him. Okay, so this is a definition of a regression equilibrium. Okay, 
Um, now, uh, uh, for this talk, we'll need all the, we'll, we, we will also need uh, two simple, uh, uh, two simple um, uh, notions. One is the social welfare of the allocations. This is the sum of uh, value of the bidders in this allocation. So this is the, you know, the sum of happiness in the system, how much value each of the bidders get. And we're going to uh, say that an allocation O1 to O1 is optimal if it maximizes the happiness, if it maximizes the social welfare among all allocations. Okay, so an allocation is optimal if it maximizes the sum of values uh, 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 among all allocations. All right, good. And again, if there are questions about definition, please uh, uh, do stop me. Allocations must always uh, assign every item to, to the bidders, right? Uh, yeah, here, yes. Here we require that every, uh, uh, every item is, uh, is allocated. Thanks. Uh, just oh. one more yeah. question. Um, so, uh, Prices are on individual items, right? Not on bundles. Right, exactly. Prices are on individual items. Each item has a price. Okay. Okay. Any um, other? Yeah, when you, when you define the optimal allocation, you don't take into account the prices, which is some kind of, you know, the, the welfare of a person is diminished somewhat by paying a greater price, isn't it? Yes, so the, the usual explanation is that, you know, uh, indeed there is uh, money that is transferred, that is changing pockets, but if we take the, uh, um, the designer into account, then, you know, uh, the, the, the players play something to the auctioneer, to the designer, and so the overall sum of money in the system is zero, so we only care of maximizing their sum of values, okay? So this is like you know, the best allocation of resources when we include the designer and the money in the system. Okay? Okay, good. So um, uh, what, what's so good about uh, valuation equilibrium? Um, uh, well, you know, uh, uh, it gives us some justification if you wish to free markets. So, um, this goes back to uh, Adam Smith's Indivisible End. So what does Adam Smith, the, like, the father of capitalism, the father of free markets, what, uh, what does he tell us in a nutshell? Well, uh, it tells us that uh, when each individual in the market acts selfishly, the market reaches an efficient state. We allocate our resources in the best way possible. Now, as a mathematician, it would be nice to have like, you know, a mathematical justification for this idea. So Adam Smith is claiming that there is like an invisible hand that, you know, allocates the, uh, 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 the resources in the most efficient way. And, you know, there is a question. So, okay, so what is this invisible hand? Um, and uh, well, regional equilibrium actually gives us one justification for this, uh, 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 for uh, Adam Smith's theory. So this is the uh, uh, famous well, well, first welfare theorem which tells us that if we look at the market that is in a well region equilibrium, then the, the, the allocation in the well region equilibrium is actually optimal. So we actually allocate the resources in the best way possible, okay? So each player is acting selfishly. Each player is just you know, like uh, uh, taking, uh, uh, <coughs> taking uh, his most profitable bundle. And somehow the, uh, 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 the, the, the market, the economy reaches which is a state which, in which the, uh, uh, all the players are maximally happy, the resources are allocated in the most efficient way. Okay. Uh, so uh, let's briefly see a proof of the first welfare theorem because like, it's uh, cute and simple. Um, so uh, let A, A1 to AN be the allocation. Again, Peter I gets uh, a set of items AI. P is P1 to PM is a price per item. This is our valuation equilibrium. And let's consider uh, any other allocation. What do we know? If you look inside the parentheses, uh, we know that each bidder prefer each bidder I prefers the bundle AI over any other bundle SI. Okay, uh, so uh, it's fine to sum over all uh, uh, all these uh, 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 allocations, all these inequalities. We got n such inequality, one for each uh, uh, player, so we can just 
uh, sum up over all of them. And, uh, and now we notice that uh, uh, the sum of prices is actually the same. We just change the order of summation. It doesn't matter if you sum over the AIs or if you sum over the uh, uh, SIs. So we can just uh, uh, cancel the sum of prices. And we get that the welfare of the AIs is bigger than the welfare of the SIs, okay? So um, uh, in other words, the, the, since SI was just, you know, the SIs were just an arbitrary allocation, we got that the uh, uh, welfare of AI is the maximum possible, that is uh, uh, the allocation A is optimal, okay? So this is the proof of the first welfare theorem. And of course, by now you're all uh, pro free, free markets, so you all became capitalists, uh, which is uh, very good, except that uh, not everything is perfect because the first welfare theorem uh, only guarantees that if there is a regression equilibrium, then the allocation is optimal. But nobody told us that a regression equilibrium uh, uh, always exists. Okay? Uh, and indeed, there are simple markets in, in which regression equilibrium uh, does not exist. And let's see, like, uh, 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 let's see one such, uh, one such example. Um, now we, we will have to use a slightly more complicated uh, uh, market. We're also going to have a Luigi in the market, and we're going to have uh, another uh, David Ockney picture in the market. And uh, the valuations of the bidder are now going to be something that is called a budget additive. What does it mean to be budget additive? It means that you're additive and, until you have some cap. Okay, so you, you know, uh, if you have some values, just add them one to one until you reach a cap, um, a cap and you know, you never uh, go above this cap. For example, uh, if you look at Mario, he has a value of $2,000 for item A, $1,000 for item B and $1,000 for item C and has a budget of $2,000. This means that uh, his value for item A alone, alone is $2,000. His values for items B and C together is $2,000, 1,000 plus 1,000. But if he gets all the three items, then uh, his value is $2,000 because we cannot go above uh, uh, the budget. Same goes for the, uh, 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 same goes for the uh, princess and for Luigi. Now we want to ask whether there is an equilibrium in this uh, market. <coughs> okay, so um, uh, if there is an equilibrium in this market, we know that uh, uh, this equilibrium must support an optimal allocation. And if you check, you'll see that the optimal allocation is the one uh, that gives the item across the diagonal. Actually, there is uh, another one, a symmetric one, but uh, it's enough to, to focus on uh, 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 this allocation. So in this allocation, uh, Mario gets C, the princess gets B, and uh, uh, Mario, uh, so, sorry, Luigi gets C, uh, the princess gets B, and uh, Mario gets A. And now we're asking whether there are market clearing prices, whether there, is, uh, uh, whether there are prices that support a real version of equilibrium with this allocation. Okay, so um, Luigi gets, uh, uh, Luigi gets uh, an item that has a value of zero for him. So he will definitely uh, not pay more than zero for, uh, 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 for this item. So we can set the price of uh, uh, item C to be zero. Okay, what about the princess? Um, well, she gets something that has a value of $1,000. But if she, that's item B, but if she takes item C at a price of zero, her profit is going to be $1,000. We want to make sure that the item that she gets has a maximum profit for her. And this means that the price of item B uh, must be zero. Otherwise, she will prefer item C. And now uh, let's consider uh, uh, Mario. Uh, the prices of items B and C, we already concluded that they are zero. So it can take something that has a value of $2,000 for him, namely the bundle to consist of both B and C and pay zero. So that's a profit of $2,000. Uh, but we know that in a version equilibrium, we must take item A. So the price of uh, uh, this item uh, uh, must be zero. But at the price of zero, Luigi will, take, uh, will prefer to take uh, uh, item A 
Why? Because it has a value of nine, uh, $900 for it. So if the price is going to be less than $900, we will have a positive profit. Right now we have a, a, a zero profit from taking item C. Uh, and this uh, gives us the desired contradiction. The price of item C must be uh, uh, at least $900. Uh, so uh, uh, Mario does not take an item that has the maximum profit for free. Okay. His profit is at most $1,100, uh, while there is a set of items, B and C, that gives him a profit of $2,000. Okay. So this is a simple example where regression equilibrium does not exist. Okay, so in fact, um, this wasn't a coincidence. Uh, we know that regression equilibrium is guaranteed, is guaranteed to exist uh, essentially, only when the valuations belong to uh, a very small class of valuations that is called gross substitutes. The exact definition of gross substitutes is not really important for this talk. And uh, there were many attempts to relax this notion uh, in recent years and before that. Uh, but what we're going to do in this talk, uh, uh, we're not going to relax this notion of origin equilibrium in order to claim that there is an equilibrium in. Uh, uh, in a more uh, uh, broad set of valuations, but rather we're going to take a different approach, which is we're going to take cognitive biases into account, the endowment effect, in order to claim that uh, in many markets, uh, there is a regression of equilibrium. Again, if we take cognitive biases into account. Okay. So uh, uh, let's try to develop these uh, notions. For that, we need the notions of an endowed valuation. What does it mean that, uh, 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 what does it mean uh, to have an endowment effect with, uh, when, when the bidders have valuations over multiple items? So first, uh, I think it is clear that, you know, if you all the bundle uh, SI, then the value of SI increases by some factor of alpha when owning it. For example, if you had a mug, then we sort of estimated the uh, uh, endowment uh, uh, parameter uh, that you have the uh, multiplicative amount that the value of a mag uh, uh, increases if you own it by something like two. So let's call it alpha. And again, I think it's kind of obvious that if you have a, a, a set of items SI, then its value increases by uh, some parameter alpha. But we also need to specify the value of the bidders for other uh, sets of items, for example, subsets of the items or supersets, or sets that are neither subsets or supersets, okay? And we're going to do it like in what I think is the simplest way uh, uh, possible. So the value of bidder I that holds a value, uh, that holds a bundle of item SI and has some endowment parameter of alpha for another set of item T is what? For uh, the subset of the items that you already own is value increases by uh, uh, um, an endowment parameter of alpha, okay? So uh, uh, um, the value for everything in S that is both in SI and in T increases by some alpha. And we want to make sure that the marginal contribution of the rest of the items remains the same. So for example, uh, um, if I uh, hold a table, then the marginal contribution of a chair to me remains the same regardless of whether I hold the table or not, okay? So, uh, um, so again, the value of the items that I own increases by a factor of alpha and I'm keeping the marginal contribution of the rest of the items the same, okay? Uh, if we do some simple rearrangement, we get that, uh, uh, um, we get the following interpretation of the endowed value of a bundle T. This is the original value of the bundle T, and we get some multiplicative factor of alpha minus, four, minus one, uh, a bonus of alpha minus one for uh, the items that I own. Okay, so this is our definition of uh, 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 endowment uh, of the endowment effect in uh, more complicated settings. Let's see a, a simple example. Again, these are budget additive valuations. Again, additive up to some cap. Um, okay, so um, now suppose that, uh, uh, so in the left you can see the original uh, budget relative valuation 
at, and at the right, you can, uh, we're going to consider a situation when Mario holds item A and as an, an endowment parameter of two. So his value for the key fairing picture alone increases by a factor of two. So it was 2,000 before, uh, now it's $4,000. Uh, his value for item B remains the same. We didn't hold it before. So, you know, it remains the same, just $1,000. What is his value for items A and B together? Note that he holds only item A. So the original value was uh, uh, $2,500. So now it's the original value, $2,500, plus the bonus of $2,000, okay? Is it clear or are there any questions? Okay, good. Um, Now let's revisit the simple, the simple uh, uh, markets that we considered before. Um, and uh, let's see that if we take uh, the endowment effect into account, now we do have uh, an equilibrium in this market. Um, okay, so uh, again, we're going to use the optimal location in the original market. We're going to assume that the uh, uh, um, the um, endowment parameter is two. And now we ask, are there any market clearing prices? And the answer is yes, there are market clearing prices. And these are the market clearing prices. Let's uh, indeed verify that uh, they are market clearing prices. Um, Mario got uh, the uh, 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 Keith Earn picture. It has a value of $2,000 for him times two because uh, he has the endowment effect. So the overall value is $4,000. It pays $2,000 for the uh, picture. So the overall profit is $2,000. And you know, it's not hard to see that if it switches to some uh, uh, other bundle, uh, it does not uh, increase its profit. Same for the pr princess. Now our value for the Andy Wall picture is $2,000, two times 1,000. Um, and again, switching to any other bundle does not increase the profit and uh, uh, Luigi still uh, gets something that has a value of zero for him and pays nothing, but he doesn't want to switch to anything else because this will give him a negative profit, okay? So what we saw is that if we take the endowment effect in this simple market, we get an equilibrium. Now, the fact that, you know, if we take endowment effect into account, we somehow get a, 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 a more markets with equilibrium is not totally surprising. This is as expected. But what is nice is that we are sort of able to uh, uh, give uh, a, a description of, of this. Um, uh, and we can see that, we can prove that uh, uh, if, we, if our valuations are submodular, which is a well-known and much broader class than gross substitute periods that we discussed before, as long as the uh, endowment parameter is at least two, an endowed equilibrium is guaranteed to exist. So let's try to do that a, a little bit more uh, uh, formally. Rafael, uh, question, yeah. can I ask a question? Uh, there is an issue of timing here, right? I mean, Mario values, once he has the picture, he values it at twice the price, but that wasn't the case at the moment that he purchased it, right? Yes, um, so we, we're not talking about uh, the mechanism that uh, 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 gives us this, uh, uh, gives us this equilibrium, like in world region equilibrium. That, that's an interesting question that, that's, that's, that's a very interesting question is how do they uh, get into this equilibrium? But we sort of ask uh, with these certain valuations, is it possible for the market to uh, reach an equilibrium? How, I don't know, but I just interesting in the most basic question, can we reach this equilibrium or not? So with regression equilibrium, the answer was no, there is no chance that you're going to reach a regression equilibrium with say some modular valuations. And with, and down, uh, with uh, uh, when we take the, uh, um, when we take the endowment effect into, uh, into account, then the answer is yes, uh, this market can in principle reach some equilibrium, whether we can see a mechanism that uh, gets it or whether we can encourage the, uh, the player somehow to get stuck in this equilibrium, I don't know, but there is a possibility to reach this equilibrium. Okay. And again, having, uh, 
having an algorithm that uh, provides this uh, 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 an algorithm or some dynamics that uh, reaches this equilibrium is a very interesting question, and we're actually going to touch it for the uh, end of this talk. Okay. Once you do have the endo equilibrium, are you still guaranteed that it satisfies uh, the maximal well-being uh, theorem that you proved earlier? Is uh, it still the second? Let me. Uh, 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 okay, I'll, I'll get to that uh, in, in this slide. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, okay. <coughs> Um, 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 okay, so what is an endowed equilibrium? So again, we consider a, a, an allocation A1 to AN and a prices P1 to PM. Uh, and we say that they are endowed equilibrium, so for some valuation V1 to VN. If there are evaluation equilibrium for the same, uh, uh, for the same allocation and prices, okay? But for the endowed valuation. Okay, so we just make the evaluation endowed, and now we're, we're getting back to the usual definition of a regression equilibrium. So these are the same. We just consider the, uh, 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 the uh, endowed valuation and look for, for a regression equilibrium with the endowed uh, uh, valuations. So this is, this is what we mean by uh, an endowed equilibrium. And uh, now what we can prove a little bit more formally, is that if all evaluations are uh, uh, submodular uh, and submodular evaluations are evaluations with decreasing marginal utilities, that is, once you add, uh, 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 once you add uh, uh, items to bigger sets, then the marginal contribution of the added item decreases. Uh, so if all evaluations are submodular, then every local optimum, O1 to ON, uh, forms a two endowed equilibrium with the following prices. The price of item J is uh, uh, simply its marginal contribution to the bidder that holds it. Okay, so let's uh, spend a little bit more time on this uh, theorem. So if all variations are submodular or have decreasing marginal utilities, then uh, uh, we can consider a local optimum. So what is a local optimum? Uh, a local optimum is simply an allocation of all items such that if you move just uh, just a single item from one player to another, then this does not increase the welfare. So local changes does not increase the uh, total happiness of the players. Okay. okay so notice that comparing to the uh, uh, comparing to the uh, 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 theorem that I told you before about our region equilibrium, we have three major changes. One, we can support uh, uh, an endowed equilibrium for a much larger class of valuations, submodular or not your substitutes. Second, we can support every local optimum, not just the global optimum as the, uh, um, as the uh, uh, first welfare theorem is telling us. And second, uh, the prices are very simple. Uh, they are just the marginal contribution of uh, each item. Now, uh, it is indeed true that with regression equilibrium, we can compute uh, the prices in polynomial time, but they are very, uh, I mean, but, but they're simply not intuitive. Here we are very natural, intuitive. We can compute these prices by hand. So in a sense, this equilibrium is much simpler than uh, a Wolverine equilibrium. Now, how good is this, uh, 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 is this approximation? So in fact, it turns out that a local optimum is a true approximation to the, uh, um, to the, uh, uh, to the optimal welfare. So um, uh, uh, we don't get the optimal allocation using an endowed equilibrium, but we get quite a good approximation of it. We are guaranteed to at least extract half of the uh, optimal happiness in the system, okay? Shachar, how tight is the constant two in the theorem? Uh, um, depending how you define tight, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it in uh, two slides, I think, okay? Um, okay, um, so uh, I want to give like a really uh, brief, uh, uh, actually, how much time do I have? You have 20 minutes, uh, including questions. 20 minutes, okay. Um, yeah, okay, so let's do a really quick uh, uh, outline of the proof because it's not really complicated. So the proof is composed of two parts. One, we want to claim that with these prices, then each player I prefers T union OI, any bundle T 
union the uh, 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 what he gets in the in the local optimum over t alone so it is always good to add items that you don't have from the uh, 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 local optimum and uh, the second uh, claim is telling us that uh, uh, player i prefers oi over t union oi okay so you want to remove everything that is not uh, uh, in your uh, uh, local optimum if you get something that includes all items in the local optimum together this gives us that uh, you get the maximum profit from uh, the local optimum and in fact i'm only going to show you the uh, uh, first claim okay so um uh, uh so so again the claim is that for any uh, bundle t player i weakly prefers t union oi over t it's good to add uh, everything in oi that you don't have uh it does not decrease your profit uh, as a reminder uh we're going to use an, an endowment parameter of two also equals two and assume that the bidder owns the bundle oi okay so vi uh, so the player uh, that has the bundle OI and as an alpha parameter and, and as an endowment parameter of two is value for the bundle T is VIT plus the value of uh, everything in the section of OI and T. Okay, so we actually need to prove the following that the profit of OI union T is bigger than the profit of T. So this is what we want to prove. Uh, notice that uh, the sum of prices that appear in the right also appear in the left is contained in the left hand side so just you know uh, add uh, edit from for edit uh, on both sides of the equation and we get uh, of the inequality and get uh, 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 the following uh, inequalities that we have to prove and now we're simply going to use the reminder we're going to rewrite the, the, uh, uh, the thing in the in the box as vit plus vi oi this is in fact this is uh, smaller than what we get from the reminder so we're we're doing it in the right direction and we're going to extend expand the right hand side exactly as in the reminder okay now we notice that vit appears in both sides of the inequality so let's just get rid of it and do a simple uh, uh, rearrangement and we get we need to show that the sum of prices of items that are in oi but not in t is at most the marginal contribution of uh, OI to OI intersect. Okay, uh, and now we're going to use uh, some modularity and our definition of prices. So, what was our definition of prices? We call that uh, this was uh, 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 just the marginal contribution of an item uh, to the player that holds it, uh, and. What we get is that uh, uh, by submodularity that we know that the sum of marginal contributions of a set of items is by submodularity always less than the marginal contribution of the bundle. So this is really easy to see if you saw one proof about submodularity. Uh, uh, if you haven't seen, uh, then you know it might take you like uh, two more minutes to see it. But uh, Let's not spend too much time of, of, on this. This is really like a simple application of the modularity. Okay, and we get what we wanted to prove. So, uh, okay, so this proves uh, that. Uh, and this naturally gives rise to a notion of an endowment gap. So, uh, an endowment gap of a class of valuations is simply uh, uh, the minimum value of alpha for which an endowed equilibrium is guaranteed to exist for any instance that contains valuation from this class. So, uh, you know, we saw that for some modular valuations, the endowment gap, gap was at most two. And the question was, okay, is it tight or no? Uh, so what do we know about that? Uh, yes, it is sort of tight. If we only consider supporting optimal locations or even locally optimal ones, then we have, uh, um, we have, uh, 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 we have instances in which, in order to support every locally optimal location, we need an endowment gap of, uh, uh, we, we need an endowment parameter of at least two. Now, but it is not so tight on the other end because for supporting an arbitrary allocation in this instance, uh, we need like uh, uh, an endowment parameter of only 1.5. Okay, so, and in general, like we have instances in, uh, for which if we want to support any allocation uh, uh, or sorry we have instances in which if we want to support some allocation 
and then we need an endowment parameter of at least 1.5. So uh, there is still a gap of between these two and 1.5, and it is an interesting question, I think, uh, to understand what is the uh, right number, whether it is two or, or 1.5. Uh, I don't know. Okay, um, now you may ask what about uh, larger class of valuations? Um, well, uh, for fractional subadditive valuations, which are some subclass of uh, ad subadditive valuations, then we have bad news, the endowment gap is uh, in fact unbounded. Okay, so, so if your valuations are in a sense more complicated than uh, submodular, uh, uh, then uh, it might be the case that uh, uh, the endowment effect is not going to save you. You're still not going to get an equal. Okay. Um, okay, what do we have in the paper beyond the endowment gap? Uh, we also prove some interesting connections between the integrality, the integrality gap and the endowment gap. It turns out that these two are definitely not the same, but they, are, they have uh, like interesting connections between them. Um, uh, there was another question about, you know, how we reach this equilibrium, uh, for example, to reach uh, a valuation equilibrium, there are very natural ascending auctions, mechanism that reach an endowment equilibrium, and it's interesting to, uh, uh, to see if we might have some, some, some similar mechanisms that reach uh, um, uh, uh, an endowment equilibrium, not just valuation equilibrium. Uh, relaxations of uh, this notion uh, are also interesting and in fact we are already consider considered in a recent paper. Um, and uh, uh, one uh, question that we didn't discuss at all is whether it is hard or not to find an equilibrium with uh, 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 submodular valuations. So we know that there is, uh, there is an equilibrium. Uh, uh, for example, if we know uh, if, if we can find, if we can efficiently find uh, a local optimum, then uh, 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 we can have, we can find a, an endowed equilibrium. This is the same equilibrium with, you know, uh, simple to find, simple to specify prices. But, you know, how hard is it to find a local optimum in the auction? And this is going to be like, you know, the second part of uh, my talk. So, uh, and we're going to briefly uh, discuss this, uh, uh, this issue. Okay. Okay, and, okay, good. Um, okay, so uh, let's talk a bit about finding a local optimum. And let's forget for this slide about, you know, auctions and all that, and let's just think about finding a local optimum in the graph. What does it mean to find a local optimum in the graph? So we have some graph, the graph is labeled, and uh, we want to find uh, a vertex that uh, its label is larger uh, than any of its uh, uh, neighboring labels, okay? Um, so this is the uh, problem of uh, finding a, a local optimum. And what would be the most naive algorithm that we can think of? Well, let's just start with some arbitrary vertex and we repeatedly move to a neighbor with a higher value. So at each point, you know, at each vertex, we just look, at, look around for a neighbor with a higher label, then switch to a neighbor with a higher label and so on and so forth. So uh, uh, how many steps are we going to make? Is this simple algorithm even going to end? Uh, the answer is of course, yes. Why? Because at every step we're moving to a vertex with a larger label. So, you know, after V, uh, v steps, we're going to hit the vertex with the uh, uh, higher, uh, the highest, uh, uh, with the highest uh, uh, label which is going to be our global optimum, which is in particular is of course a local optimum. So uh, we might have to do uh, uh, V queries. Um, we might have to do V queries. And in fact, it's not, it's not terribly hard to see that this is, there are instances in which we might uh, make that many queries. Okay, so this is like a, 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 a naive algorithm. Uh, can we do better? Um, yes, if you use randomization, we can do uh, a randomized local search. We do that as follows. We select at random square root of v vertices, uh, query their values, and then we start a local search from the vertex with the highest value. Okay? So how many qu queries are we expected to make? How many steps are we expected to make? 
Well, we query square root of the vertex s. Uh, with some good probability, the vertex with the uh, highest value among the uh, uh, vertices that we randomly selected is going to have one of the highest square root of v values. Okay, so a local search that begins with that vertex is going to take us a uh, 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 square root of v steps. So overall, we made something like a square root of v uh, steps, square root of v queries, what is the value of this uh, vertex, and, uh, um, and we know that this is actually the best that is possible. Um, okay. So this was about uh, um, this, this was about uh, uh, finding a local optimum in graphs, but what about finding a local optimum in auction? So we want to find a local optimum in a two-player commercial auction. We call a, a local optimum in, in an auction is an allocation for which, if we move just a single item from uh, uh, one player to the to the other, this does not increase the uh, uh, welfare, and it is not really hard to see that. We we can reduce this problem to the problem of finding a local optimum on the hypercube. So here is the uh, fourth dimensional hypercube. We call that, you know, in the hypercube, uh, um, two vertices uh, are neighbors if their humming distance differs only by one, if they differ only by one bit. And what we're going to do is we're going to do the obvious thing. We're going to associate each vertex of the hypercube with, uh, uh, with an allocation. For example, if we look at the, the vertex 0, 1, 1, 1, we're going to associate it with the allocation that gives all zeros to player one and all ones to player two. We're going to, al to associate 0, 1, 1, 1 with the allocation that gives A to uh, uh, player one and BCD to, uh, um, to, um, to player two. And what is going to be the label of this vertex is simply going to be the welfare V1 of A plus V2 of BCD. Okay? And now notice that if we uh, 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 visit a neighboring uh, edge, uh, this this is completely uh, this is completely identical to uh, uh, moving to a neighboring allocation to an, to an allocation that differs uh, uh, by moving only uh, one item from one player to the other. Okay. So how many queries do we do we need in order to uh, find this uh, uh, this local optimum? We know that there is an algorithm that makes uh, square root of v uh, 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 queries. In our case, this is not really good because you know the number of the number of allocations, the number of vertices of the hypercube is exponential in the number of items. We're interested in algorithms that are polynomially the number of items, and square root of something that is exponential is way too much for us. Okay. So uh, this is not going to help us just running a, a local search. And in fact, we can also show, it's not really hard to see, that finding a local optimum of the auction, and we can also find uh, a local optimum of the higher cube. Okay, so um, this method is not uh, uh, going to help us in order if we want to efficiently find a local optimum in, in an auction. So uh, um, what can we do? We can use communication complexity. Up until now, we only counted the number of queries that we're making. What is the value of uh, you know, this, uh, uh, this vertex? What is the label of uh, that vertex? And so on and so forth. But recall that our application was about an auction. In an auction setting, we may assume that uh, computers might uh, answer more complicated types of queries. For example, we might just you know, ask a bidder to uh, tell us what is his uh, highest uh, value uh, bundle that consists of items B and C and not of A, or, you know, or something uh, complicated like this. We might ask him an arbitrary question. Uh, so it, is, it makes much more sense to consider communication complexity settings, uh, which translates to the following, pro uh, to the following problem. Mario holds uh, a sum function that gives a label to each, uh, 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 that gives a value for each uh, uh, vertex of the uh, hypercube. Uh, the princess holds uh, 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 also some uh, function, and we want to find a local maximum of FA plus FB. Again, while minimizing the number of bits that the two players exchange. Okay, so in our, in the terms of auctions, Mario holds uh, 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 Mario holds some valuation function, Bob holds some valuation function, the princess holds some valuation function, and want to find a local optimum of uh, uh, this auction. So this is uh, equivalent 
uh, to the formulation that we had now in terms of uh, 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 local option. Okay, um, so let's just uh, have a simple example. Suppose that uh, 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 the princess value for you know, this uh, uh, right vertex is two, uh, and uh, Mario has a value of four. The overall label of this vertex is going to be six. The uh, uh, label of the leftmost uh, of this left uh, vertex is going to be 36. And, you know, uh, and we simply want to find uh, uh, a local optimum of this, of this uh, uh, new labeling, which is simply the sum of the functions. But again, now the player uh, shares or divides the information about the uh, uh, the vertex of the vertices of the uh, sorry now the players uh, uh, divides the information about the vertices of the uh, label the labels of the vertices okay um, so what do we know to prove that you know even considering this this extended setting even if we give the players more power and enable them to ask any type of queries. This is still not going to uh, give us much. Give us much. Uh, finding a local maximum still requires a communication complexity of square root, square root of n. Okay, so I see that I don't have uh, any time to talk about the proof, but uh, let me just say is that uh, um, the difficulty in proving this is that uh, this is a type of problem for which a solution always exists. So there is always a local maximum in the graph, the global maximum. Uh, this problem has a low non-deterministic communication complexity. Uh, once you get uh, a, a, a vertex, it's easy to verify whether it is, uh, um, it is uh, a local maximum or not. And this is exactly the type of, uh, uh, exactly the type of uh, uh, question that is, it is hard to answer with communication complexity. Because standard tools like this jointness have high non-deterministic complexity and are not total. So the challenge is you know, to prove something about this type of uh, question. Okay, so I won't discuss anything about the proof. Let's just go to the summary. Also not going to discuss anything about the application that we have. Okay, so um, we started this talk uh, talking about cognitive biases, about the endowment effect. Uh, and we, we saw that in some well-studied scenarios, if you take endowment effect into account, if, if you take cognitive biases into account, uh, uh, we might improve the outcome. So this not only improve uh, 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 the applicability of, you know, of uh, these concepts to real life scenarios, it might give us a better explanation for why we see equilibrium uh, uh, in real life, although the theory does not predict that we're going to have uh, um, an equilibrium with many markets. And not only that we predict that, uh, uh, that we're going to have more equilibrium, you know, in more markets, this is sort of improves the overall efficiency of the market. And we saw that uh, uh, this uh, uh, question of thinking about the endowment effect and evolution equilibrium uh, um, naturally, naturally leads us to think about pure theory of computer science questions, namely the communication complexity of uh, 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 local search, and uh, even answers them. Okay, thank you. So, um, thank you very much. We have time for one or, one or two questions. Um, if Someone in the audience has them. Uh, yes, can I ask? Uh, yeah. Shahar. Yeah. So there, you said that if you don't uh, assume some modularity, then no, uh, no alpha will save you, right? Yeah. Is there anything uh, weaker than some modularity that, that we're so, still? So, yeah, sorry. So we saw that uh, even going slightly beyond some modular evaluations, uh, it's still not helpful. Um, what there, there was a, uh, another paper by uh, Michal Feldman and students that uh, is trying to um, relax our assumptions, defines and down and valuations in a different way. Uh, and what they show that if you um, have another definition of endowment valuation, then you can support a larger class of uh, 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 a larger class of valuation. Now, so yeah, so the, the the question is, of course, whether you know you believe their formulation, whether you believe our formulation. But if you believe theirs, then we can support uh, a larger class of valuations. Thank you.
So uh, I believe we're out of time. Um, so um, please um, uh, let's uh, thank our speaker. Um, okay, so this concludes the talk. Um, thank you very much. Yes.